Good morning, Virtual Church. Good to have you with us this morning. It is uh, Trinity United Methodist Church in downtown Chesterfield Courthouse. It is Sunday, the 14th day of November, and uh, we're just excited to be with you. This morning, earlier, uh, as we gathered together, we um, celebrated the life of this community, the joys and the concerns taking place here. Uh, and one of the joys that we celebrated was the, uh, the sacrifice and service of our veterans that are a part of this community of faith and congregation. This morning as we begin to, to listen to and to explore God's word for us today, uh, our scripture will be read by uh, Captain, uh, Captain uh, Ashley McGuire, and I have to address her this morning as ma'am because she always calls me sir. Uh, so ma'am, welcome to, uh, to the Trinity Church to read our scripture for us this morning. Ashley is one of the newer members of our congregation and we're just delighted to have her with us. Thank you, Ashley. Jesus left the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Teacher, look, what awesome stones and buildings. Mm -hmm. Jesus responded, Do you see these enormous buildings? 
Not even one stone will be left upon another. All will be demolished. Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives across from the temple. Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us when will these things happen? What sign will show that all these things are about to come to an end? Jesus said, Watch out that no one deceives you. Many people will come in my name saying, I'm the one. They will deceive many people. When you hear of wars and reports of wars, do not be alarmed. These things must happen, but this isn't the end yet. Nations and kingdoms will fight against each other, and there will be earthquakes and famines in all sorts of places. These things are just the beginning of the things associated with the end. The word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. So I think this morning I'm going to um, going to sit. And some of you know that normally when I sit, that means I'm trying to take some of the intensity off. Um, and this is a way of my imposing some restraint on myself. Uh, and that's not the case today. Um, today it just seems the, uh, the appropriate posture um, to consider the, the word of God that we've just heard uh, from Ashley McGuire. Let us pray. Holy God, pour out your spirit upon us that we will hear what you desire of us today, that the words that I speak will be pleasing and acceptable to you. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Amen. At the um, commencement address to the West Point class of 1942, General George Marshall spoke these words. We are determined that before the sun sets on this terrible struggle, referring, of course, to World War II, our flag will be recognized throughout the world as a symbol of freedom on the one hand and of overwhelming force on the other. It would be hard for us to imagine, given the uh, the scope and magnitude of American might um, presented during World War II, it would be hard for us to imagine a time in which we would not be victorious in war. We could not imagine in that context a 9-11 any more than we could imagine a January 6, 2021. The disciples walking with Jesus in the temple in Jerusalem were astonished with its power and magnificence. It was a, a mighty edifice, a testament to not only human accomplishment, but as understood as part of God's blessing on the Jewish people and the Jewish community. Herod had built uh, or remodeled that temple. This is considered in, in history to be the second temple. And when it was constructed, it's referred to as the second temple period. The first temple, of course, was built by King Solomon, the son of David, uh, about a thousand years before the time of Jesus. And after about a 500-year reign, when the Babylonians conquered Judea, the temple was destroyed, along with much of Jerusalem. And it wasn't until they, the exiles returned from Babylonia that under the, the leadership of Governor Zerubbabel, that the temple was rebuilt on a much smaller scale than what Solomon had originally constructed. And so when Herod became king, Herod, Herod had an ego to match his vision of what the world could look like to memorialize him. And so building projects were the thing that Herod embraced. And all over the land of Judea, there were massive structures raised to remember and memorialize Herod, including the remodeling of the temple. 
It was considered to be a grand structure. The doors were described as 49 feet high and 24 feet wide, the temple gates. And they were encased in silver and gold. The walls at some places and the, and the outer walls were, were as much as nine stories high. And some of the stones were said to weigh a hundred tons, a single stone of a hundred tons. It was just massive and it was magnificent, a testament to God's blessing and human accomplishment. And it was unfathomable to think that it would one day crumble that anything could shatter it or harm it or damage it, that anything would make those stones come to the ground. The Romans, they brought it down around the year 70. In response to a revolt by the Jewish people, they destroyed the temple. The only thing that remains of it today is the western wall, and you if you've ever been there, you've, you know this, or if you've seen pictures of it, often referred to as the Wailing Wall. It is the place, a solemn place of prayer. And it's massive. And you can see the, the architecture. You can see the ba bottom stones that pay tribute to Solomon's original construction. And then Zerubbabel's on top of it, and Herod's on top of that. And then there's a period where the Crusaders in the Middle Ages tried to rebuild it but unsuccessfully. So when the disciples are standing in the midst of this magnificent structure, they cannot imagine a time in which it would start to fall or crumble. Mark's 13th chapter is often referred to as a, a little apocalypse. The book of Daniel in the Old Testament is apocalyptic literature. The book of Revelation at the end of the New Testament is apocalyptic literature. And it has its own kind of style and flow to it. In the 13th chapter, words given to, uh, to Jesus uh, follow that, that style and flow. And as, Jesus, and as they, uh, the disciples, you know, if you picked up on this in, in the reading, the disciples make the initial observation about the magnificence of the stones in, Je in the building, and Jesus says, yeah, but they're all going to come down. But it's later, not while they're still standing in the temple, but it's later after they have left the temple and they've left the city proper, They've crossed through the Kidron Valley and they've gone up to the, to the Mount of Olives and they are looking across the valley and down upon this massive structure of the temple. And it's there in the Mount of Olives that they begin to see what Jesus wants them to see, which is the big picture, to get a glimpse of the long view. Mark says that Jesus sits down opposite the temple. Strong word. He's opposite the temple. He's not a part of it. He's opposite it. And the question, the question that's on the disciples' mind is when they sat with Jesus and the, the four, James and John and, and Andrew and Simon Peter, their question is what? When? So you told us that this is going to happen, right? You've told us that the walls are going to come crumbling down. Tell us, Rabbi, when is this going to happen? They're so like us, aren't they? Or maybe we're like them. We want to know when it's going to happen. We want to know when the first snowfall is going to come. We want to know when the paycheck's going to arrive. We want to know when those script orders are going to start putting money back into the church treasury. We always want to know when. We want to know when Christ is coming again, don't we? We want to know when. We've been waiting for 2,000 years. When is it going to happen? And just as we always want to know when, Jesus rarely answers their question. Did you notice that? <laughs> Some of you who've been in a book study with me know that uh, I like that Jesus style. Don't I, Beth Wilkes? <laughs> yeah. Jesus answers the question that they should have asked. The question that he would want them to think about. Not when is this going to happen, but what is happening? And why is it important to you today? Mm -hmm. See, what Jesus is pointing out in this passage 
in these eight verses that Ashley read for us this morning is that these signs of man-made disasters and natural disasters, of wars and of famines and earthquakes and floods, these signs happen every day. They happen every day. And they're not a mark of the end time, but rather they're a mark of the beginning, of the end of the age. So Jesus' message in that, what he's trying to get the disciples to see, is that every day should be a day of getting ready. It should be a day of preparing. And to begin to look at the, the long view, the big picture that's transforming in human history, that's transforming around the globe, and not become too focused on the thing right in front of us. Hmm. See, biblical prophecies, biblical prophecies, whether they're Old Testament or New Testament, whether Jesus utters them or one of the Isaiah or Jeremiah or Amos, they're not fortune-telling. We often think of the word prophecy as if, as, as if um, the, the prophet is, is trying to predict the future, to read tea leaves or read, read our lines on our palms, but that's not it. The biblical prophets, including Jesus in the 13th chapter of Mark, is trying to call us to repent. Repent. Change your hearts, change your lives, for the kingdom of God is at hand. These were the words that Jesus used to begin his ministry in Mark's gospel. And here we are now, almost at the end, in the next chapter, he'll be arrested. And here we are almost at the end and Jesus is again calling us to change our hearts and to change our lives because the kingdom of God is at hand. And because we are often focused on the time, right? We're often focused on the when. When we hear those words, the kingdom of God is at hand, we think it's coming soon. We think it's, it's right around the corner, that it's just down the hall. It's, it's next week's message. When is the kingdom going to get here? But that's not the context. It's not the, 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 uh, the expanse in which Jesus is speaking. He's not talking linear. He's not talking about time. He's not talking chronos. He's talking about space. That the kingdom of God is at hand. It's beside you, on your right and on your left. The kingdom of God is in front of you and behind you. The kingdom of God is all around you and encompassing you. The kingdom of God is within you. The kingdom of God is here and within you. And this is what Jesus wants his disciples, including us, to see and to hear. And to begin to prepare for that coming today. Because when our walls come crumbling down, when the worlds that we have built, the things that we have created, begin to fall, it is God who will sustain us. In conversations with the wisdom people, and usually when I talk about the wisdom people, you know I'm speaking of the elders, the elders of the church. But wisdom has a way of working itself into the lives of a lot of folks. And age isn't always a factor. Life experience, I think, is a factor. Um, but the wisdom folks have often shared with me this observation. I don't know how people without faith can handle it. I don't know how people without faith can manage or survive. And they're talking about those contexts and situations in which their life that they had constructed came tumbling down. When their spouse or significant other died. When their child died. And in the midst of all of that, when they suffered their own health concerns and problems and surgeries and hospitalizations, when it seemed like everything around them was beginning to fall apart, some of the greatest wisdom has come from people who 
are battling cancer and the treatments associated with it, in which they acknowledge that it is their faith that is sustaining them, and it's not just their reliance upon God, but as they see and, and experience God manifested in their family and in their friends and their church family that just surround them with love. This is what Jesus is calling us to, to be prepared for those times and those places in our lives when our walls come crumbling down. Be prepared for it today and not wait until the last minute, not to put it off, but to turn in faith and to trust God because that's where our strength comes from. That's where our hope is manifest. That's where we will experience the eternal and infinite love that will hold us up when it feels like the world is falling apart around us. Mm. Kathleen Norris is quoted in Feasting in the Word around this scripture as talking about a friend of hers, a colleague, another um, professor, she was a, a biblical scholar, who had been diagnosed with cancer. Over the course of several years, she came close to dying three times. But after extensive treatment, radiation, and chemotherapy, there came a time in which there was, was a welcome remission. Her prognosis was uncertain, but she was able to go back to work and start doing the things that she loved to begin to, to teach again and to write. And she told her mentor, she said, I never want to go back. I never want to go back. Because now I know what each morning means. And I'm so grateful just to be alive. The other woman said, you know, over these three years, we've been through a lot together. And the response was, yes, yes, we have. And hasn't it been a blessing? Hasn't it been a blessing? Her faith allowed her to experience the hope and the presence and the power of a living God in the moment. And it transformed her life. And it was there, God was there, when she needed him most. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Friends, let's sing. Let's stand and sing My Lighthouse.
good to be with you on this beautiful Sunday morning. Receive this blessing. Beloved, be encouraged in the Lord. Stand firm in the witness of the gospel. And may the Lord continue to bless you and keep you. Go in peace to be people of peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit.